Hello again, uh, Randy Stafford. And as uh, a person who coordinated uh, some of the speakers for this symposium, it, it's my honor to introduce these speakers, uh, beginning with Kristen Iverson. A great honor to introduce Kristen. Her book, Full Body Burden, um, awakened me to the Rocky Flats issue in 2012, even though my aunt and uncle had, had worked at the plant. So uh, Kristen grew up in Colorado. Uh, she writes literary nonfiction. She has a PhD from uh, DU, University of Denver. And she's a two-time winner of the Colorado Book Award with books including Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats, Doom with a View, Historical and Cultural Contexts of the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant, in which I have a chapter, um, thanks to Kristen. Also, Molly Brown, Unraveling the Myth, and Shadow Boxing, Art and Craft in Creative Nonfiction, and uh, other books in addition to that. She has a forthcoming literary biography of Nikola Tesla, which will be very interesting. And her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, Hotel America, The American Scholar, and other publications. Full Body Burden in particular has been chosen by more than 30 universities around the country for their common read slash first year experience programs and is the subject of a forthcoming documentary film. In addition to her two Colorado Book Awards, Kristen's awards include an Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award, the Barbara Sudler Award for Nonfiction, the Reading the West Award in Nonfiction, the Alumni Award for Creative and Academic Achievement at the University of Memphis, the Colorado Endowment for the Humanities Prize, the ANA Award for Journalistic Excellence, and fellowships from the San Jose Arts Council, Colorado Art Ranch, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. In 2013, Kristen was selected as a Barnes & Noble Great New Writer and was the top finalist for the Barnes & Noble Discover Award. In 2021, Kristen was chosen as a Fulbright Scholar to the University of Bergen in Norway. She has taught at universities around the country and abroad and is currently Professor of English and Creative Writing at the University of Cincinnati, where she also serves as the literary nonfiction editor of the Cincinnati Review. So everyone, please welcome Kristen Iverson. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here. And uh, I'm so glad that I have an opportunity to be part of this uh, seminar today. I think it's very, very important. And um, I look forward to all the presentations um, that are going to happen today um, after mine. What I'm going to do is just a very brief overview of the history of the Rocky Flats nuclear weapons plant uh, from its beginnings in 1951 to the present time, 2022. My name is Kristen Iverson. I am a professor and an author. Um, I teach at the University of Cincinnati, but I hold a PhD from the University of Denver. I grew up in Colorado and grew up very near the Rocky Flats plant. I've written two books on this subject, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats, which is a blend of memoir, personal story, the story of my community, the history of Rocky Flats, and investigative journalism. I'm also the editor of a book entitled Doom with a View, Historical and Cultural Context of the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant. Um, this book is very recent. It just came out about a year ago, and it is a collection of essays and articles uh, written by a number of different people, historians, scientists, um, medical personnel attorneys, some of the people who will be speaking with you today. Um, and uh, as I said, that book has been out for about a year. There's a lot of um, great information in that. So I'm going to begin with the definition of body burden, which I think is important um, to keep in mind as we talk about plutonium. The term body burden, which I used in the title of my book, refer refers to the amount of radioactive material present in a human body, which acts as an internal and ongoing source of radiation. Once a human body has absorbed a particle uh, of plutonium or um, been affected by plutonium, it can stay in the body for up to 200 years. And I mention this because um, one of the things that I think it's important to keep in mind is the human story um, behind the history of Rocky Flats and how this plant and everything that happened with this plant up to the present day affects individual lives and in individual families. 
on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, we'll begin in 1951. The U.S. Atomic Energy Commission acquired roughly 2,500 acres for the Rocky Flats plant to produce nuclear and non-nuclear weapons, including plutonium triggers for nuclear weapons. Um, this site, as many of you know, is 15 miles from Denver, nine miles from Boulder. It was just uh, about two miles as the crow flies from my childhood home. Rocky Flats was one of 13 nuclear weapons production facilities in the United States during the Cold War. Rocky Flats was really the heart of this system because it produced the plutonium hits or triggers that are at the center of the bomb. Um, from 1952 to 1954, more than 800 buildings um, were built at Rocky Flats. Much of it was underground. Secret operations began in 1952. It was owned by the Atomic Energy Commission, now the Department of Energy, and operated by Dow Chemical after Dow was operated by Rockwell and then E&G, EG and g um, And EG and g was uh, managing the plant when I was a worker at Rocky Flats. From 1952 to 1989, Rocky Flats produced more than 70,000 plutonium pits or triggers at a cost of roughly $4 million each. These pits or triggers are the small spherical explosives that provide an atomic bomb's chain reaction. The plutonium came from Hanford and Oak Ridge supplied the enriched uranium. Once the buttons were shaped uh, into pits or triggers, those triggers were sent to the Pantex facility in Amarillo, Texas, to be assembled into fission weapons and the primary stages of nuclear we thermonuclear weapons. Plutonium has a half-life, a little more than 24,000 years. Each button or trigger, just to put this in context, each button or trigger produced at Rocky Flats contained enough breathable particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth. Workers were not allowed to talk about their work to anyone, including their families. Local newspapers reported that the site would not be used to produce nuclear weapons. Local communities welcomed the jobs. The public was kept in the dark deliberately and um, workers were not allowed to talk about what they did. And even at the plant, and this is true to some extent, even when I worked there, different parts of the plant, workers in different parts of the plant were not aware of what other workers were doing. So there was an enormous amount of um, secrecy around the facility. Um, in my neighborhood, when I was a kid, a lot of the um, families in my neighborhood, their parents um, worked at Rocky Flats. And the story was because it was owned by Dow Chemical um, that they were producing household cleaning supplies or something along those lines. And, and for years, um, my mother thought that they were making scrubbing bubbles. They were not making scrubbing bubbles. As I mentioned, the site eventually grew to more than 800 buildings, much of it overground. I, much of it underground. Um, very little was visible um, from the road. This is an aerial shot, obviously. And um, I, I like this shot in particular because um, we can take note of the solar ponds there, which was one of the efforts later on to try to control and contain some of the contamination. I want to show you some photos of, of the um, of workers at Rocky Flats and what was involved in the actual process of um, machining and shaping plutonium buttons. This is a shot of a glove box. Um, workers would stand in front of these boxes and put their arms in lead-lined gloves and um, shape the material, work with the material. This is a glove box line at Rocky Flats. And you can see it's kind of a two-tiered um, system here. Workers would stand on the line um, and then the plutonium buttons would be moved along the top and they would drop down and be machined um, or worked with in some way. Um, I want to emphasize that plutonium is highly flammable uh, and it's very difficult to put out a plutonium fire. Once it occurs, you can't use water uh, on a plutonium fire without risking a criticality. 
Here's another shot of, um, of a glove box line to kind of give you an idea um, of what was going on. And, and just a couple of miles away and all of the growing communities are Arvada and Westminster, we had no idea that, of course, that any of this was, um, was going on. And of course, um, what we didn't know as residents, as local residents uh, in the area, was that we were being exposed to many of the same things that the workers were being exposed to. And again, most of it, even on behalf of the workers, on the part of the workers, um, they were not aware of what they were being exposed to exactly when and where and what. And it wasn't until 1993 that the Department of Energy admitted that the site had contained at least 14 tons of plutonium, seven tons of enriched uranium, 281 tons of depleted uranium, I'm sorry, seven tons of enriched uranium, 65 tons of beryllium, and large amounts of other toxic chemicals, including carbon tetrachloride. The Department of Energy, Dow, and Rockwell repeatedly denied that Rocky Flats was involved in nuclear activities or posed any danger at all to the public. I'm going to show just a couple of personal families, family photos here. Um, in the sense that um, my experience, the experience of my family, my neighbors, other workers, uh, is representative of what happened to a lot of people uh, when Rocky Flats um, was built. Unlike Los Alamos and other isolated nuclear weapons production facilities, many families in Arvada live near the facility, including mine. Uh, and this is an interesting point to think about because if you worked at Los Alamos, um, you lived at Los Alamos. It was, it was a contained community. Uh, uh, it was secret, um, certainly, and Rocky Flats was secret uh, to a large extent, but the difference was that Rocky Flats, workers at Rocky Flats were drawn from local communities, and that's part of the reason why um, the facility was located at that site. I'm showing here a, a photo of some of the plutonium storage at Rocky Flats, and I want to say a word about another word about the location of the plant. Um, a whistleblower eventually revealed that there was a mistake in um, the decision that was made to locate the plant where it is located, the high plain, windy plain, um, just outside of Boulder and Denver. The initial wind patterns um, for the um, site report were based on the old um, Stapleton Airport, some of you remember where that airport was, and not at that site where it is currently located, where it's been located for all of these decades. And that's very important to keep in mind because for one thing, the Chinook winds come down through the mountains there and sweep across the site to the present day. Um, and as you know, the winds can uh, reach very high speeds out there and they will pick up whatever particulate or whatever is going on at the site and carry it over parts of Arvada, Westminster, other parts in the Metro Denver area. And I'll show you a, a map um, in a few minutes about that. Um, and, uh, and the, but the other thing is that they were really dependent upon, upon local workers and they had to locate the plant close enough so that people could, could get to work in the morning. The wind, when I was working at Rocky Flats, um, the wind could reached such high levels out there that it was not uncommon for people to have their windshields blown out. Um, so uh, there's a lot of weather and um, turnover of weather there, uh, wind, snow, rain, all the different things that happen in Colorado. Here's another shot of the workers at Rocky Flats moving uh, material between barrels. Many of the workers at Rocky Flats did become ill um, and this went on for the entire time that Rocky Flats was in operation. They discovered that they were un unable to collect workers' compensation. And this was just the beginning of decades of workers not being able to receive any support from local government or from the federal government. Um, so workers were unable to um, receive any support with health issues, cancers, et cetera. Um, and uh, residents too, there was uh, no place for people to turn for honest information or any facts about what was actually happening at the plant and the potential health effects of this facility. 
1953, the plant began manufacturing plutonium pits. Um, over the course of 40 years, there were uh, many incidents of contamination, fire, and other issues. I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. I know many of the things that I touch on, um, other people today will be picking up on more of the details. This is a photo of barrels, uh, more than 5,000 barrels eventually stood out in the open for more than 11 years. And um, what happened with those barrels? Radioactive and toxic material leaked into the soil, contaminated the groundwater and was carried off site. And uh, the public was not informed. I'm gonna back up just a second and show you if you can see the kind of ridge behind that um, area there. That's the ridge where my sisters and I used to ride our, our horses right out in that area. That's how close this was to residential area. In 1958, an incinerator for plutonium contaminated waste was installed in building 771, the primary production building at Rocky Flats. Um, and that's what this incinerator looked like. And, and this turned out to be a pretty big deal when we get to the uh, raid and the, some of the um, other events that have happened that caused a great deal of, of contamination in the air in particular. I wanna talk for a moment about some of the fires at Rocky Flats. As I mentioned over the years, there were more than 40 fires at Rocky Flats, two big ones in particular. Um, the first one um, was in 1957, and here you can see a worker is pointing to where the fire started. And, and what happened with these fires is that um, the glove box lines, which I showed you a photo of earlier, um, were all connected in a serpentine kind of formation. And if a fire started in one and was not caught or they weren't able to stop it in time, it could travel through that whole line very, very quickly. And um, that's what happened in 1957 um, and then again in 1969. This is a shot of burned out filters from the 1957 fire. The fire was so intense that the filters were burned out, the measuring equipment was burned out. We will never know exactly how much radioactive material and other toxins were released uh, over the Metro Denver area uh, during this fire um, because of this fire. Plutonium was detected in a school playground 12 miles away. The second big fire was in May of 1969. This is what's called the Mother's Day fire and uh, is very similar um, situation in some ways, it's, it's quite a dramatic story. We came very close to a criticality in that fire. And in fact, many people believe that a criticality may have occurred. Um, the roof of the building literally <laughs> began to melt and rise almost like a um, marshmallow bubble. And we came very close to having the roof uh, breach. So a lot of material was released during that fire as well. And you can see here, um, on this map, and the photos and the and the maps I'm going to show you during this presentation, they come either from the Department of Energy directly, or they are part of um, the class action lawsuit, uh, Cook v. Rockwell, um, based on DOE information. So here you can see the the plume uh, and um, lifetime cancer risk um, associated with this plume. And um, my house, just again for perspective, was kind of right there. On this particular Mother's Day, my family was having Mother's Day brunch outside at a restaurant. We had no idea that, that um, there was a fire at the plant and a radioactive cloud was traveling over our head. This is a shot of um, a map of contaminated residential areas around Rocky Flats following that fire and some of the other contamination incidents that happened. Again, for perspective, um, here's Stanley Lake and uh, our house was right, right there. Yeah, kind of right there. Um, high, uh, extensive home development in this area. One of the problems in, um, 
so in the 1970s, we began to see um, lawsuits, which led to an expansion of the buffer zone to an additional 4,027 acres for the site itself. So we had the core site and then the buffer zone. In 1973, elevated tritium levels were found in Walnut Creek and Great Western Reservoir. The city of Broomfield had to completely cut off any physical, any physical connection uh, between Rocky Flats and Broomfield's uh, drinking water supply. Another thing that happened in the 1970s is um, Carl Johnson um, came into office. He was the director of the Jefferson County Health Department from 1976 to 1981. I should probably mention that he is not uh, a re related to Dr. Mark Johnson, um, whom I believe is speaking as part of our uh, seminar today. Uh, but uh, Carl Johnson um, is such an interesting figure for many reasons. Um, when he came into office, um, there was a lot of controversy about Rocky Flats and what was really happening. P people didn't really know what was going on the plant. And um, there were illnesses in my neighborhood and nearby neighborhoods, uh, areas around the plant. Um, and there was a lot of uh, fear and speculation because we just didn't know. Uh, when my parents bought their house, um, they had to sign a waiver that in order to get a HUD loan um, that specified, yes, there is plutonium in this soil, but we believe it's safe. And they had to acknowledge that in order to get a home loan to buy their house. And that's what we were told, um, everyone, residential neighborhoods, we were all told that, that this is safe and you don't have to worry about it. It's plutonium, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't feel it. Um, so so we, we didn't know. Um, one thing that Carl Johnson did was he initiated studies that found significant levels of plutonium contamination in soil in areas around Rocky Flats. He argued that homes should not be built in the area around Rocky Flats. And he published a great deal about this, um, which is still publicly available. However, he was fired from his position um, by elected officials, some of whom had um, direct connections to the real estate, to real estate development in the area. And of course, there was a great deal of home building going on and, and it was an area of high growth. And um, a lot of that, uh, people involved in those business and development interests were, were opposed to any sort of um, prevention of ongoing development. Uh, so Dr. Carl Johnson um, was removed from his position. However, he eventually won a whistleblower lawsuit against Jefferson County and um, much of the information that he presented turned out to be accurate. Um, just another quick family shot. Like many families, we rode our horses in the fields around Rocky Flats and swam on the local creeks and Stanley Lake. And I just want to emphasize this, um, Stanley Lake was contaminated, other water areas were contaminated, and there were kids and families. You know, we were outside all the time. My parents and many other parents felt that they were raising their kids in this kind of perfect environment with mountains and dogs, and we had horses, and um, and it, 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 they thought that they were raising their kids in the, in the perfect environment, and it was it was very difficult difficult for my parents to learn um, and even believe uh, that anything was going on like this. Um, my mother and father both used to say, if surely the government would tell us, or Dow or Rockwell would tell us if this area was unsafe. They did not. In the 1970s, we also begin to see some things happening with um, animals and and some of the activism around that. And I want to just spend a moment talking about that. This is local farmer Lloyd Mixon. Um, he had a small farm very close to the Rocky Flats site. And um, he would notice problems and deformities in his animals. Chickens, um, cows, horses, other people had problems with horses. Um, and uh, he was one of the first people who would actually go to local meetings, meetings with politicians, and he would bring this little pig scooter who was born without any back legs, and he would say, what's going on at Rocky Flats? He was um, criticized for this. Um, 
and uh, certainly the um, Rockwell and um, all of the um, representatives of Rocky Flats uh, said that he um, that his farm was not clean and not safe, and that's why he was he was having problems. But there are other indications that, that there were things going on um, with animals at the time. This is a, a shot of a memo from 1961 um, where it talks about radioactive rabbits um, and how they found um, levels of uh, concentrations of plutonium, particularly in the, in the back legs and the hind feet. Cattle in fields at Rocky Flats showed significant levels of plutonium in their bodies. And um, this information led to a, a significant uh, lawsuit. Um, we, we heard rumors in cancer, we heard rumors about cancers and illnesses in animals and in people. In my neighborhood, and my, my parents eventually had two houses adjacent to Rocky Flats in both neighborhoods, uh, nearly, every, every, uh, nearly every family um, had cancer. Two of my young childhood friends died of very unusual cancers. In the 1970s, we begin to see some of the protests at Rocky Flats. Um, there were a number of organizations involved with this, Catholic nuns, um, local, national, and even international organizations. And, and the biggest push uh, was for truth and transparency. We just want to know what's happening and how dangerous, is it dangerous, what's going on? Uh, this TB, kind of an infamous shot here, was set up on the tracks to try to prevent trains loaded with radioactive material from going in and out of the plant. This is a shot of poet Allen Ginsberg. Some of you may know him, a uh, very famous poet um, who taught at the Naropa Institute in Boulder. And uh, many people sat on the tracks, again, to try to prevent the trains from coming in and also to draw national and international attention to, to the plant itself. Local protests grew larger and drew people from around the country. A big year was uh, from 1978 to 1979, the Rocky Flats Truth Force um, had a big impact on this and uh, many, many others, including Dr. Leroy Moore, um, who's been involved in uh, Rocky Flats um, issues for many years, pushed for truth and transparency about Rocky Flats. Another person who has um, been involved with Rocky Flats from its earliest days is Daniel Ellsberg. Um, you may know him from some of his other uh, uh, he's written a number of books um, and, of course, is uh, famous for the Pentagon Papers and, and the Vietnam War. Um, again, he's pushed for truth and transparency, and he worked with the Rocky Flats Truth Force in 1978. But lots of other people were advocating to try to find out um, the truth of Rocky Flats and how they were affected and when and where and how, and that certainly includes the workers. Um, workers who became ill um, often were denied compensation for illnesses due to exposures, and they advocated uh, for fair treatment. Um, and it was difficult for them to prove exposure, and I know this will be talked about more specifically later on, but um, it was di very difficult to prove uh, when you were exposed and what you were exposed to, and then to try to prove a direct link um, between that exposure and your illness. Um, another worker I wanna talk about is Department of Energy Manager Charlie Wolf, here he's in a shot with his wife Kathy in 2008, who spent years fighting the US government over his brain cancer, which he felt was due to his work at Rocky Flats. Charlie Wolf, um, whom I met when I worked out at Rocky Flats, um, worked in the hot areas with his employees. He passed away in 2009, sadly, but the work that his family did and, and all the other people who worked along with him um, were instrumental in having the Charlie Wolf Nuclear Workers' Compensation Act expanded. Um, 
for workers who were exposed to radiation and um, it expanded the list of things that they could um, apply for in terms of receiving compensation. Um, families continue to move into these fast growing areas. This is just a shot of me and my two boys. When I was working at Rocky Flats, uh, we knew nothing about the facility or the potential dangers. Uh, I first learned of what was really going on um, from a, a documentary that happened around this time and also um, a documentary entitled Dark Circle, which some of you may be familiar with, which won an Emmy and the grand prize for documentary at the Sundance Film Festival. Many of the people in my neighborhood um, experienced illnesses um, and health issues related to Rocky Flats. Uh, this is local resident Tamara Smith Mesa, who lived just down the road from my home. And over the years, she's had uh, numerous brain tumors and um, is still with us today. I'm very grateful for that. She's, she's been very brave and she and her physicians in Colorado and in New York, New York believe that um, her health issues are connected to exposures at Rocky Flats. From Rocky Flats, her family home was right uh, on the lake and directly downwind from Rocky Flats. I wanna talk a little bit more about some of the protests. Um, local residents continue to the present day to protest. There was um, an encirclement in 1983 of 17,000 people that encircled the plant. Um, and it was some of these, um, it was some of these protests and um, some of the workers who were deeply involved in advocating for workers and truth and transparency that eventually led to the raid on Rocky Flats on June 6, 1989. This is a really um, interesting uh, moment and I'll pause here for just a moment and talk about that before I talk about the cleanup. Um, on June 6, 1989, the plant was raided by agents of the FBI and EPA, partly based on information that they had received from plant insiders. There's so much uh, that I could say about this raid, and I know it's going to be talked about in the seminar today. Um, I believe it's the only time in the history of our country that two government agencies have raided another government agency. Um, they found numerous violations of federal anti-pollution laws. Production of plutonium triggers was halted in December of 1989 and never resumed. That doesn't mean that the contamination did not continue after that date, but production was stopped. Eventually a federal grand jury was impaneled to investigate apparent violations of the Clean Water Act and federal toxic waste laws. And it was revealed that in addition to the fires that I mentioned earlier, the plant had discharged plutonium through smokestacks sprayed contaminated water on an open field, and as I showed you earlier, stored barrels of waste outside. The site eventually became an EPA Superfund site. It was listed on the national priorities list. Rockwell, um, after having um, stated for years in the papers <laughs> that uh, everything was safe and there was no problem, um, had to backtrack. They, uh, the site was replaced by EG&G. And um, although the grand jury had wanted uh, indictments, there were no indictments. And um, Rockwell was charged with environmental crimes, including violations of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, RICRA, and the Clean Water Act. Rockwell paid an $18.5 million fine at that time, the largest environmental penalty ever imposed. But this was still less than the company had been paid in bonuses for running the plant. Rockwell claimed that the DOE had specifically exempted them from most environmental laws. At this time in 1992, the grand jury's special report was sealed. And that's important to keep in mind because that report was not available um, when the cleanup occurred. 
60 cartons of evidence um, and the report itself remain uh, sealed and unavailable. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the cleanup. Um, the, part, the Department of Energy initially estimated, and this is what was said when I was working at the plant, that it would take at least 70 years and cost $36.6 billion to adequately clean it up. This was impossible um, and undoable. And many people at that time, um, scientists, environmentalists, others felt that we should basically um, declare it a, a no trespassing zone, just seal it off and then um, see what we can do to either leave it alone or try to remediate the site in some way, but certainly um, not build houses and allow people to recreate on the site. Um, however, that was uh, not possible in 1995, the Department of Energy contracted with the Tizer Hill Company to do an accelerated cleanup at a cost of $7.3 billion. This so-called cleanup did not aim to return the site to background concentrations of plutonium. It is a controversial cleanup and some workers um, and others refer to it as more of a cover-up than a cleanup. That's still debated to the present day. Local residents still report um, illnesses and health issues that they feel is related to um, contamination from the site. Here is a shot from um, the Cook v. Rockwell um, lawsuit showing acceptable levels of plutonium at the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, showing uh, so-called acceptable levels of plutonium, 50 picocuries per gram of soil for three feet, then down to six feet, a thousand picocuries, and then no limit below that. And this is important to keep in mind because although a great deal of material was removed from the site, a great deal of material remains and much of it is underground. Here is another shot from um, that same lawsuit, a court exhibit uh, regarding how much remains on site and potentially remains, at, remains on site. These are known waste and burial sites at Rocky Flats and um, residential areas are very, very close to these areas. And you can see Stanley Lake is right over here, which is where my childhood home was. And Great Western Reservoir is up here, which is a reservoir that was affected, um, affected the Broomfield water supply. I want to mention that around the year 2000, following the cleanup, more than 50 years after the plant began operation or nearly 50 years after, workers be did begin receiving benefits from the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Act, which was created by President Bill Clinton and enacted in 2000. However, despite millions of dollars that have been paid, Many claims uh, continue to be denied as workers have um, found it very difficult to prove that exposures at Rocky Flats caused or contributed to their illnesses. Um, and the other part of this, of course, is that there has never been any comprehensive study or epidemiological study of residents of people who lived near Rocky Flats or continue to live near Rocky Flats. Um, and there has never been any kind of hotline or help um, for people who experience health issues and um, want to have a greater understanding of why these things might be going on. A personal note, I wrote Full Body Burden seven years ago. It's been out for a while now and I, I continue to get, and others as well continue to get emails every week from people who um, are experiencing cancers, rare cancers in particular. Uh, and live in these areas around the site. In 2001, the site was established as a National Wildlife Refuge as cleanup was still underway. In 2005, the Department of Energy declared the cleanup to be um, complete at a cost of, as I mentioned, $7 billion. 
around 4,000 acres are now open for public hiking and biking. 1,300 acres, that is the core um, production area, um, is the close to the public and um, contamination levels are so high that uh, it will never be safe for human use. New home construction continues near Rocky Flats. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Do we know for sure? It's very difficult for people to know, as you can see, um, the site here. It's very difficult. It is challenging for people to find full information about what happened at Rocky Flats and why it's important to keep thinking about the site in so many different ways. Rocky Flats is a very important site environmentally in terms of public health and also historically. Um, it was a very important part of the Cold War in this country. Uh, it was at the heart of um, nuclear weapons production in the United States. And yet, even now, very few people know what happened at that site. Very, people know, very few people know the history of Rocky Flats the fact that it might still be a risk. We don't know, they don't know. It's hard for them to find out. In 2008, to get back to the homeowner's lawsuit, this Cookie Rockwell lawsuit on behalf of more than 12,000 local residents in 2008 had a judgment against the defendants for $926 million. That included compensatory damages, punitive damages and prejudgment interest. That judgment was reversed by the Court of Appeals in 2010, leaving the plaintiffs with nothing. In 2015, in the second Court of Appeals decision, the court reinstated the case and remanded it to the trial court. Finally, the case was settled. And in 2016, after 26 years of litigation, the defendants agreed to pay $375 million to settle this class action suit. I want to talk for a moment about some of the risks that remain at Rocky Flats. Um, these are photos of uh, the flooding in 2017 um, that flooded parts of the site and um, local neighborhoods. And then, of course, I'm sure um, everyone is aware of this, the Marshall Fire in January of 2022 in Superior, which came very close to the Rocky Flats site, um, fortunately did not reach it, such a terrible and tragic fire. Um, but if we were to have a fire of this magnitude reach the Rocky Flat site, there are a lot of questions. Would there be plutonium uptake in the air? Um, what would be the effect of a fire on this site um, for local residents um, and beyond? I'm gonna stay on this slide here for a moment. So what are we faced? with the present day here about Rocky Flats. Independent soil samples, um, recent um, independent soil, so soil samples east of Rocky Flats along Indiana Street showed significant um, plutonium. And I know that will be talked about today. Residents continue to report health, health issues, including ex excessive rates of cancer, birth defects, and other health problems like thyroid and immune deficiency disorders. Studies have found that those living downwind from Rocky Flats um, may have unusually high rates of breast, thyroid, prostate, colon, and rare cancers. And yet people are told that there's nothing unusual. There's nothing um, to worry about. Veter veterinarians in the Arvada Westminster area report that dogs in the areas near Rocky Flats have abnormally high rates of bone and foot cancers. And I conducted some of those interviews on myself um, with a, a couple of veterinarians who reported um, increased levels of cancer in the, in the pads and the paws of, of dogs. In my neighborhood, in my um, childhood neighborhood, we all had horses. Um, strontium was found in the bones of the horses. And yet the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment and local business interests and home builders continue to state that there is no risk, there is no link between the Rocky Flats site 
and rates of cancer or other um, diseases or issues going on in the area. Today, um, the plant and all the buildings are gone. The site is still contaminated with residu residual plutonium, carbon tetrachloride, and what remains is small releases of beryllium and tritium, as well as dioxin from incineration. Yes, the site is being monitored. Is it enough? Another interesting note, the refuge is one of more than 560 refuges, national wildlife refuges in the National Wildlife Refuge System nationwide. At least 30 of those 560 sites are managed by the wildlife, that are managed by the Wildlife Service have a history of military or weapons production. Converting a heavily polluted weapons complex into a wildlife refuge is frankly cheaper than making it safe for homes, schools, and businesses, and creates the perception that areas near and adjacent to the site are completely safe for home and business development. So just to sum up, um, as a, as a writer, as a historian, as a journalist, as a resident, and as a former Rocky Flats worker, I just want to say that we cannot forget Rocky Flats. We must not forget the legacy of Rocky Flats. And we're working hard to forget. We're working hard to erase. As I mentioned earlier, this site is important historically, environmentally, and in terms of public health and animal health. But what would you know about Rocky Flats if you didn't happen to pick up one of the you know, few books on Rocky Flats or attend a seminar like we're having today? There are no signs at Rocky Flats that talk about what happened there and why it's important. The only indication on the site at the moment is um, the Cold War horse. You might've seen the big, beautiful red horse in a hazmat suit. Um, designed by Jeff Geip, whose father worked at Rocky Flats. That's the only visible um, sign of what happened at the site. And, and, and there's a plaque next to the horse that talks about the history of the site and why it's important that we need to know about this and keep this in mind. And that horse's nose looks directly at the, um, the old, you know, the, uh, the heart of the plant where plutonium pits were actually manufactured. Even that horse, even that sign has been controversial. When it was first put up, um, it was only a matter of days before someone came by with a truck and chains and they pulled the horse to the ground and smashed it. Artist Jeff Geit packed everything up, took it back to his studio in New York, uh, recreated the horse and brought it back and put it up at the site again. And again, this is on private land, this is, um, adjacent to the site, it's not on the site, and um, put up a security fence around it. There are very strong feelings about Rocky Flats. I understand those feelings. As a worker, I understood why people were proud of the work that they did at Rocky Flats and how they felt that, some of them felt that we were winning the Cold War because of what we did at Rocky Flats. Other workers were deeply conflicted about the mission of the plant and the product that we were producing. Local residents too, there was so much divisiveness in the communities and in the neighborhoods. Those who were proud of whatever was going on out there, let's sweep it under the rug and don't talk about it. Um, if you get sick, God's will. Um, you know, it's not related to the plant, it's just the way life is. And then there were people who were activists um, very early on. And really what they were advocating for was just tell us the truth, tell us what's happening. Um, and then all of the um, um, health workers and, and scientists and researchers, everybody involved in this huge story. Rocky Flats has been dividing our community and our state for decades, and we haven't wanted to face what happened there and tell the whole truth. And I hope that that's what we can begin, um, that's what we can begin to do. Um, 
as of today, as of this moment, it is possible to go hiking or biking at Rocky Flats, to drive past the site, to buy a home near Rocky Flats, and never hear the story of what happened there and why it continues to have a potentially deadly legacy for public health and the environment and all of us who live in the state of Colorado and beyond. This is not just a local story, a story about Colorado. This is a national and international story that is of crucial importance. We need to have more studies. We need to have more truth and transparency. We need to be more honest about what happened at this site. I'm going to end um, with just a quick mention of places where you um, might go for a little bit more information about some of the things that I just touched on. Like I said, many more information will be forthcoming in the seminar today, but here are a couple more places to look. Um, there's a very good book by Len Ackland called Making a Real Killing, Rocky Flats and the Nuclear West. I believe this was the first book to come out about Rocky Flats and its excellence, very detailed, footnoted, um, fine work. Another fantastic book is The Ambushed Grand Jury, edited, written and edited by Wes McKinley and Karen Balcony. And this is really the story of um, the grand jury investigation and uh, which I just touched on very briefly. It's, it's a really big, complex story. This is where you go to find out more information about that. And then I'll briefly mention my own two books, Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. Again, there's, uh, this is a weave of my personal story, the story of my community, the workers, the story of Rocky Flats, the national story of the Cold War, and then indeed what was happening um, internationally and how um, you all may know the phrase, the personal is the political. What I wanted to do with this book was tell the story of Rocky Flats through the eyes of the people who lived it all different kinds of people, the workers, the residents, the families in my neighborhood. And this book is very heavily footnoted as well. And then finally, I'll end with this book, Doom with a View. This um, just came out about a year ago, Historical and Cultural Context of the Rocky Flats Nuclear Weapons Plant. Um, I co-edited this book with an editor uh, from the Smithsonian, and it contains articles and essays by um, attorneys who've been involved with um, different cases at Rocky Flats. Um, several of the people who are speaking today have articles in this book. Um, we've got an excellent book, uh, an excellent essay by a historian, a cultural historian, just many, many different perspectives looking at Rocky Flats and, um, and how important it is to our community and beyond. So I think I'll end with that. Um, Thank you so much and thank you for being here.